Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. Before we get started, I want to say thank you to our sponsor for this video, which is BetterHelp. I've talked to you guys a lot about BetterHelp in the past and if you know me, you know I'm someone who is a huge advocate for getting help when you need it. Now, if you have never heard of BetterHelp before, BetterHelp is an online counseling service where after you sign up for their website, you will then fill out a questionnaire and get matched with a counselor. If at any time you feel like you want to change your counselor for any reason at all, you will be able to do that for no additional charge. BetterHelp has counselors who specialize in depression, anxiety, LGBTQ plus matters, relationships, family trauma, grief, sleeping issues, and more. BetterHelp is available worldwide and financial aid is available to those who qualify. And with BetterHelp, you'll be able to set up phone and video sessions with your counselor and you will also be able to text them throughout the day whenever you feel like you need to. So I'm going to have the link in the description box below for you guys to sign up with BetterHelp. If you guys use my code INSTINCT, you will get 10% off your first month using BetterHelp. Again, I will have all the information in the description box below for you guys to go check out. And with that being said, thank you so much BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Now let's move on to the rest of the case. So as you guys can tell by the title of today's case, today we are discussing a man who has been noted to be one of the most terrifying cannibal killers in all of history. This is definitely one of those cases where the more I got invested in it and the more research I did, the more my mind was just absolutely blown. Today we are talking about a man who is known to be the celebrity cannibal. That is the name that he has been given and you will understand why as we continue on with this case. And I'm going to be honest with you guys when I say that this case was a very, very tough one to get through. Typically, you know, after looking at so many cases, you just by nature become somewhat immune to seeing the things that you're seeing and reading about the things that you're reading. However, every once in a while, there will be one that just hits you to your core. And this one definitely did. It is not for the weak stomachs out there. I will just say that. We're going to get into some graphic details today about cannibalism and things like that. So, if that is not your jam, if you get sick easily or don't feel good easily, just click out right now. This isn't the one for you and that's okay. I will see you next week. But for those who do want to stick around, today we are talking about a man named Asai Sagawa. Asai Sagawa is a Japanese man who was born on April 26th, 1949 in Kobe, Japan to his parents. Asai came from a relatively wealthy family. His father was a businessman who worked as the president of a company called Curita Water Industries. Issei was born prematurely and it was reported that when he was born, he was small enough to fit in the palm of his father's hand. And this is what allegedly caused him to have a smaller build as an adult. At full growth, Issei was about five feet tall and he did have some health issues as well. Right after he was born, he developed a disease called enteritis, which is when your small intestine is inflamed. So because of this, Asai received several injections growing up of potassium and calcium. Even as he grew into adulthood, along with his height, there were other parts of his body that were very small, including his feet and his hands. And his voice also never dropped. It never dropped fully like all the other kids his age were. So because of this, his voice did seem a lot higher and made him sound more so like what a female's voice would be perceived as. Asai has said, that he is not the type of man that most women would have found attractive. Growing up, Asai was described as being more reserved. He was quiet, he was shy, and he really did keep to himself. Something that he really did love was books and literature. He was always reading. And like I said, he was more of a quiet kid and not very social, so he spent a lot of his time reading. Asai described his childhood as some of the best times of his life. He grew up with brothers and stated that both both of his parents loved him deeply and raised him lovingly surrounded by nature. Now, after graduating high school, Asai went on to attend Waco University, and then he went on to complete his master's degree in English literature at Kwansai University. At the age of 27, Asai then moved to France to attend the University of Paris and hopefully get his PhD. That was his plan. Now, everything that I just told you about Asai's childhood and his upbringing, it all sounds relatively 
normal. It sounds like Asai was really set up for success. He had a loving family. His education was thriving. He was studying for his PhD. It really seemed like he had it all figured out. However, just like in most of these cases that we see, no one really knew who Asai really was and what he was capable of. Asai has said that his cannibalistic desires began in the first grade. He said that at school one day, he saw the thigh of a handsome boy. And once he saw this boy's thigh, he wanted to know what it would taste like. Now, most first graders don't really even know what cannibalism is. So the fact that Asai was having these desires from such a young age is pretty telling. Asai has also admitted to part participating in bestiality with his dog at a young age. And Asai has said that all throughout his life, from his teenage years to his adult years, he was hyper-focused and obsessed with finding the perfect woman. It was said that the reason that he was so obsessed with finding the perfect woman and the reason that he said he was so obsessed with finding the perfect woman was because he saw so many flaws in his own physical appearance. He was shorter. His voice wasn't as deep. He had small hands and feet. He wasn't the type Type of person that most women would look at and desire over, especially not the type of women that Asai found himself attracted to. So because he saw so many flaws in his own appearance, he really became hyper-focused on people who he thought were perfect. Asai definitely had a type in his early adult years, and that was white women. He loved tall, white women and that was what he was attracted to. It, it was the type of women that he would always desire after and always seem to lean towards. Now before we dive in to the main act that led to Asai being named as the celebrity cannibal, let's look at some of the series of events that occurred leading up to this. Now Asai's first known attempt of cannibalism happened when he was only 24 years old and again at this time he was studying at Waco University located in Tokyo. Asai had actually stalked a German woman and followed her home to her apartment. And Asai has said that his intention in doing all of this, his intention in breaking into her home was to cut off a piece of her flesh somehow without her noticing. And once that would happen, he would then leave her apartment, go home and eat the flesh that he had taken. He said that his intention was never to kill this woman. He just simply wanted to take a piece of her skin off of her and then walk out scotch-free essentially with her flesh. Now this attempt was extremely unsuccessful because Asai broke into this woman's home while she was sleeping and when he approached her in her bed she actually woke up and when she woke up she screamed and pushed Asai to the ground. Remember he had a smaller build so it wasn't that much of a fight that she had to put up and once she pushed him to the ground she was able to call the authorities who then came to her home and arrested Asai and charged him with attempted rape. Now, these attempted rape charges, Asai said it was kind of like a game for him because this wasn't the reason. He wasn't going into her home to rape her. He was going into her home to cut off a piece of her skin and take it home with him. So Asai has said he felt a sense of power knowing that the authorities didn't know what his true intentions were. Now, these attempted rape charges, regardless of his intention, were ultimately dropped because Asai's father was actually able to pay off the victim. So basically paid her a settlement fee to drop the charges, which she agreed to and the charges were dropped. And that was that on that attempt. Now, once Asai moved from Tokyo to France to attend the University of Paris, he said that almost every single night of his stay, he would quote, bring a prostitute home and then try to shoot them. But for some reason, my fingers froze up and I couldn't pull the trigger. And quote. That is a direct quote from Asai and it's honestly terrifying to hear that saying that his just his fingers froze up and he just couldn't pull the trigger. Now let's move on to what happened on June 11th 1981 in Paris. Now this next series of events that we're going to be talking about is coming from the perspective of Asai himself as did a lot of the previous information that I just gave you. Asai has actually done a 30 minute interview I believe with Vice and it has about 16 
million views on YouTube. It was uploaded in 2012. So if you want to go watch that interview, you can. Um, you can just look it up. It's called Interview with a Cannibal. And let me just warn you before you do, you will see images in that video that you will never be able to unsee. The entire video interview is extremely unsettling and disturbing. I know this is very unsettling and disturbing too, but you will see things in there that you will never be able to unsee. And that warning wasn't really given out on that interview that I'm talking about. So if you do go watch that, just know you're gonna see pictures of a corpse. It's a lot. So if you, if that doesn't, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know, but if you want to go watch the interview and if you wanna hear Asai say it from his own mouth, you can also do that after you watch this as well. Just fair warning you going into it. So again, at this time, Asai was studying at the University of Paris and it was while he was studying there that he came across a woman who fit his exact profile. This woman is named Renee Hartfelt. She was a tall, beautiful, beautiful Northern European woman. She stood at about five feet, 10 inches tall and was a 25 year old Dutch student at the time. Now Assay and Renee actually met because the two of them shared a class together and Assay said that the second he saw Renee, he sat down next to her in class and immediately fell in love with her. He said he had quote, never seen a woman like her before, end quote. Assay also admitted to drawing sketches of Renee during class and while he was at home. That way she would never catch him staring at her. So he just drew sketches of her instead. Now Renee and Assay actually developed a friendship. They became pretty good friends and they would go over to each other's homes for dinner often and they would spend a lot of time together. But their friendship was just that. It was very platonic. There was no romantic connection there. And over time, Assay actually crafted a plan and this plan was that Renee was going to be his first victim. So what happened was Assay had approached Renee and asked her to come over to his house because he said that his professor had asked him to record German poetry and he told Renee that he really needed help with this. So he asked her to come over for dinner at his apartment and then the two of them would work on this poetry together. Now Renee agreed to this. She said sure and on the night of June 11th she went over to Assay's apartment not having any idea what she was walking into. Now once the two of them were getting settled into Assay's apartment and working on this German poetry, Assay said he picked out the poem that he wanted Renee to read, he printed it out, and he gave it to her. While she was reading the poetry, Assay went behind her so she couldn't see him and grabbed for his gun that was in the nearby closet, continuing to talk to her like everything was normal. Assay then stood behind Renee held up the gun, pulled the trigger, and shot Renee in the back of the neck ultimately ending her life. Assay said that after Renee was shot, she first collapsed over the desk that she was sitting at. She was sitting at a desk with a chair and when she got shot, her body folded over and then after it folded over, her body as well as the chair that she was sitting in fell onto the ground as well. This is when Assay placed a towel underneath Renee's head to try and calm down the bleeding and then began to undress her. According to Assay, he said that prior to this murder, Murder, he actually had an entire plan of how he was going to go about eating Renee's body. And I want to read a direct quote from him, which was, quote, I wanted to eat her. That doesn't mean I wanted to kill her. But I came to the realization that in order to eat her, I had to kill her. Now, after undressing Renee, Assay started on Renee's backside on her right. And he said that the reason he chose her right side instead of her left side was because the left is where your heart is. And ironically enough, Assay doesn't like blood. So he knew that there would be more blood flow on the left side, which is why he started with the right. Now, Assay's first idea was to just bite directly through Renee's skin. However, when he attempted this, he said it ended up hurting his jaw so he went into his kitchen and he grabbed a butter knife and brought it back to Renee's body and tried to cut a piece out of her that way however he realized that that also was not doing the job well enough it was really stiff and really hard to cut properly so Assay then decided that he was going to go to the grocery store and pick up a curved butcher knife and this is the knife that ultimately successfully cut through Renee now Assay said that when 
he was cutting through Renee, he expected immediately to see, quote, red meat. However, that was not the case. When he cut through Renee, there was a layer of what he called a corn-like substance, a yellow corn-like substance. And what he didn't realize at the time that he learned later on was that yellow layer was actually fat. So he had to get rid of all of the fat, which he did with his hands. And then that is what ultimately led him to the second layer, which was the red meat that he was referring to. After figuring out how to successfully cut through her body, Assay said that the first part of Renee that he removed was her thighs. The thighs were his favorite part, so he removed those first and put those in the fridge. He then continued to cut up her body and put multiple other pieces of her in the fridge as well. After cutting up her body as much as he could, Assay then went on to have sex with Renee's corpse. After this act, he then made a fried meal out of the body parts that he had collected from Renee's body. And then when it came to dismembering Renee's body for disposal purposes, Say bit Renee's nose so hard that he could hear the cartilage crunching. And then he cut out her tongue, put it in his mouth and watched himself in the mirror as he ate her tongue. Now, when it came to disposing of Renee's body, Say had actually previously purchased two two suitcases solely for the purpose of disposing Renee's body. So he brought out the two suitcases and it took him a couple hours to clean everything up and then put the body parts of Renee into these two suitcases. After he did that, he ended up calling a cab and asked the cab driver to take him as well as his suitcases to a nearby lake. Now Assay arrived at the park at about eight o'clock p.m. and when the cab driver helped Assay by lifting out the suitcases, from the trunk of his car, the suitcases were extremely heavy and the cab driver actually made a joke and said, what, do you have a dead body in these bags? And Assay kind of laughed off the joke and just said, no, they're my books for school. And so the suitcases were then given to Assay and he walked into the park. Now, Assay said that his biggest mistake here was the fact that this was summer in France and it does not get dark until pretty late. And so at eight o'clock p.m., it's still light outside. There's still people out at the park sunbathing, having picnics, relaxing. It's still fairly crowded. So for Assay to walk into this park with these two giant suitcases trying to find a place to dispose of them, it then became a lot trickier of a task. Now once Assay finally found a spot to dispose of the suitcases, he ended up pushing the bags down a slope into a lake. And he said that after he did this, he had absolutely no energy left left and so he ended up just pausing for a second. He paused and he looked out on the lake and he watched the sunset and Assay said that while watching the sunset he saw an older man and a younger boy and he said that quote for the first time everything was in color end quote. Now I'm not sure if seeing this older man and this child was a figment of his imagination or if they were actually people that he was just watching that I'm uncertain of. However he said that all of this just caused him to pause for a second and really take everything in. Now, while this was happening and while he was taking in the sunset, Assay heard someone let out a huge scream and he ended up turning around and saw a man trying to unzip his suitcases. Now, this man looked at Assay and asked, are these your suitcases? And Assay said, no, they aren't, which to this day, he said that he regrets because he feels like if he just said, yes, they are my suitcases, don't open them, then the man wouldn't have gone on to do what he did did, which was ultimately to unzip the suitcases and find the dismembered body parts of Renee's body. The man unzips the suitcase and he ends up contacting the authorities. Now, while this is all happening, somehow Assay manages to walk away, just completely walk away from the scene, scotch-free, unscathed, and traveled back to his apartment where he then made another meal out of the leftover parts that he had from Renee's body. Assay continued to eat the body parts that he he had left over from Renee for the following four days after dismembering her body until he was ultimately arrested. Now, according to Assay, he 
said that once he was arrested, he felt a sense of relief. He felt like he was finally going to be able to communicate with others in the public. However, obviously that didn't happen because he was put in jail. However, before he was set to trial, he was interviewed by three psychiatrists who all said that Assay was mentally insane, therefore unfit to stand trial. So instead of going to trial and potentially going to prison for forever, he actually got admitted to a criminal psychiatric hospital. Now at first, Assay was being kept in France. So he was being kept at this hospital in France and this case got so much recognition. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone knew who Assay was and the people living in France were pretty mad that they had to spend their like tax paying dollars to help this man and especially because he wasn't from France. They basically just didn't want to claim him essentially and they caused such an uproar about this that authorities actually ended up deporting Asai from France back to Japan. Now when Asai got to Japan he was then transported to a different psychiatric hospital who once he got there said that he actually was mentally sane. So he was sane and he could sit trial however because they weren't in France anymore, which is where this all happened, they couldn't arrest Assay. So now you have the French saying that he is mentally unstable and he cannot sit trial, so we're going to put him in a mental hospital, to then him traveling over to Japan after being deported, where they're saying he is mentally sane, he can't stay in the mental hospital because he doesn't fit the qualifications. So ultimately, they ended up just letting him go and he became a free man. Just like that, literally just like that. He was free, no jail time, no, not even probation, no nothing. He had absolutely nothing. He was just a free man, just like that. Now, once he was set free, Assay realized that he had no job and he had no income and not a lot of people wanted to hire him considering the fact that he had murdered and ate a person. So because of this, Assay turned to writing. Like I said in the beginning, he loved books. So he started writing books. And I believe in total, he actually wrote about 20 novels, one of them being a graphic novel. And if you guys remember the Blake Libel case that we covered, where we talked about the fact that Blake Libel used one of his graphic novels as a basic blueprint for his murder, this was basically the same thing, except this graphic novel was published after the murder of Renee. So Assay went on to write a graphic novel called The Fog. And in this, he basically went into detail about his murder of Renee. Now Assay's family and obviously Renee's family did not want him publishing this book for obvious reasons. They didn't want to attract more attention to the situation. Renee's family just wanted to be left alone and left out of this. The fact that this guy was getting more recognition, the fact that he was free in general, but the fact that he was now going to profit off of their daughter's murder. They just couldn't believe it. Same with Assay's family. They did not want anything to do with this either. However, Assay went against both of the family's wishes and ended up publishing the novel anyways. I want to acknowledge too that it wasn't like Assay was kept up, locked in his apartment, shunned away from society, and that's why he was just like writing all of these books. Assay was a completely free man. He could go out and do anything that he wanted. He had just as much basic human interaction as literally anyone else. He went on to travel and so socialize with other women. And after writing books, he then went on to write restaurant reviews. He wrote restaurant reviews for a magazine. Along with that, he appeared on different talk shows and he appeared on cooking shows where he would be told to eat raw meat, which whoever came up with that idea needs to be fired automatically. Because you're capitalizing on the fact that this man has eaten someone. So you're telling him to eat raw meat. It's just, it's mind blowing the mindset that people had about this. He also went on to dabble in painting and he started making these paintings of nude women and selling them. And in 1992, he even appeared in a low budget porn movie where his role in the porn was eating a woman. I mean, it was fake, but it was the same thing. His role in this movie was to eat the body parts of another woman. And it's just, again, capitalizing off 
of the fact that this man is a literal cannibal. Now, Assay's family severely struggled from all of this. Obviously, Renee's family severely struggled from all this as well. The fact that this man, the murderer of their daughter, was getting so much notoriety and so much infamy based off of this and what he did to their daughter, I can't even imagine. But Assay's family also really struggled with this. Assay's father had to quit his job. His mother attempted suicide and his brother also developed health problems as well. Now, based off of what I learned off of my research, as of 2019, similar to the James Bulger case that we recently talked about, Assay was actually given a new name. He was given an all new identity by the government, which was similar to the James Bulger case in the sense that James's murderers also got a brand new identity from the government. What I don't understand about Assay's circumstance, however, is the fact that he went on to live his life after the murder as a free man with his original identity. People know what he looks like. People know what he sounds like. People know what he's done. So why in his older years now decide to give him a new identity? Because he's currently 71 years old and alive. So why are you, first of all, protecting him at all? Second of all, giving him a new identity after he has already gone on to do interviews and talk on talk shows and do sh low budget porn movies. Like why give him a whole new identity now? What's the point? Now I want to talk about the why. I mean, obviously, as we always say here, there's no justifiable why, there's no justifiable reason for anyone to ever commit such a heinous act. However, when Assay was asked why, why do you think you have these cannibalistic tendencies? He said that when he was younger, he had a dream and this dream involved him and his brother and they were in a boiling pot together like a pasta pot basically when you make pasta and you put the boiling water in it that's basically what he was saying that he was in with his brother and him and his brother were being prepared to be a meal for someone else and he said he became from that point on then fascinated with cannibalism however instead of being what was consumed he wanted to be the consumer so that's the why kind of and that's basically the case that's all the facts we have on this case. Like I said, Asay is currently 71 years old and alive. And I cannot wait to hear what you guys have to say about this case because the fact that Asay, again, is just out living life. I've seen reports that said that he's living with his brother and that his brother is taking care of him. However, the fact that he isn't in prison in general is mind blowing to me. The fact that he went to the mental hospital in Japan and they said, no, you are fit for trial. And then just nothing came of that. Again, I know it's a jurisdiction thing. I know the crime happened in France and that is why they can't try him in Japan for it. However, I feel like an exception should have been made because this is literal cannibalism. So you guys can let me know what you think about that in the comments down below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much. And I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video and I'll see you this time next week for a brand new true crime video. So see you then.